Uniqlo, or rather its parent company, Fast Retailing, has catapulted itself a bazaar or parent company, Inditex, as the most valuable fashion retailer on earth. And while value and profit are two totally different barometers of success, and Zara still makes more money than Uniqlo, it still presents a well-lit signal that Uniqlo is going above and beyond its station. So today we explore the reason why, and we ask, how does Uniqlo keep winning? I'm your boy, Reggie Casual, and this is Before we get into this episode of WTH, be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you want extended BTS content or fashion conversation, join us on Patreon. You'll gain access to our brand building Patreon only series class, as well as access to our private Discord filled with individuals looking to build meaningful fashion brands, personal brands, or just talk fashion. They're all welcome. Thanks again. Now back to the episode. In 2005, Uniqlo, already an established player in the Japanese retail space, opened its first stores in the United States. Its initial goal was to eat at its competitors, H&M and Zara, but this quickly shifted gears once the owner and CEO, Tadashi Annai, realized that the American market didn't need to be dressed as much as clothed. A very narrow distinction to be sure, but it provided Uniqlo with a gateway into one of the most fickle markets in the Western world, that being the United States. The difference between Japanese and American fashion consumers is a very distinct one. The Japanese are essentially one culture and are informed largely by that culture. Thus, shopping habits and trends are far more predictable. Whereas in America, the various cultures, ethnicities, and lifestyles can diverge wildly from city to city, let alone state to state. And this was something Yan Nai realized on a trip to America in his youth during the 1960s. As he states, he was surprised to see a country of immigrants thrive. Thus, knowing this, the introduction of Uniqlo's lifewear campaign comes as no surprise. Uniqlo went from basics fast fashion retailer to a retailer dedicated to clothing all people, quite often at a higher quality than its competitors all while using a Japanese approach to style by allowing people to dress themselves as they see fit without the need to worry about trends or being fashion forward. This was further explored in 2009 when Uniqlo took a gamble on elevating its approach by enlisting the talents of Jill Sonder to create Uniqlo Plus J to glowing reviews, no less. Parent company Fast Retailing would also acquire Link Theory Holdings in the same year. 2009, the same Link Theory Holdings that owns the New York-based retailer, Theory. Next, Uniqlo would tackle Street by hiring streetwear legend Nigo, founder of A Bathing Ape and Human Made, to spearhead Uniqlo UT in 2014, a graphic T-line who then brought on the likes of Pharrell, Keith Haring, Cause Verdi, Daniel Arsham, among others, under the Uniqlo banner as collaborators. Uniqlo's successes prompted the company to further elevate its basics by reaching out to Christophe Lemaire in 2016 to direct its higher inline Uniqlo U, following that up with J.W. Anderson in 2017. This smart strategy of collaborations was further explored with Japanese mainstay brands like Undercover and Engineered Garments. And finally, we catch up to 2020 and 2021 with the return of the Uniqlo Plus J line, which arguably is ushering in a new era of basics and essentials that outpace what its competitors offer, namely H&M and Zara. But those are the plays that Uniqlo controlled. Looking from a bird's eye view, the conditions were perfect for Uniqlo's surge as a major player in the retail space. Uniqlo's true strength comes from its infrastructure in the Asian market. At the time of this episode, Uniqlo has 2,300 stores worldwide, give or take, with 815 in Japan and 791 in China, its second biggest market, which is impressive. In fact, 70% of Uniqlo's stores are located throughout Asia. And in the case for Zara, it's flipped. 70% of its stores are in Europe with only 20% in Asia. 
But more importantly, Asia has been on the upswing in economic growth, at least outside of Japan and in particular, China. And with COVID recovery being much faster in Asia than in the West, again, particularly in China, Uniqlo has benefited indirectly. To buttress the assist, the pandemic also required more individuals to start working from home, especially in Japan, which was a clear about face for a country notorious for its brutal office work culture. As a result, leisure clothes and now even athleisure, which Uniqlo does incredibly well, has been bolstered. And now that telework is more popular than ever, Uniqlo benefits by offering quality, fairly good looking clothing consistently at a good price, something that its competitors, again, can't match. CEO Tadashi Annai even states that the days of suits have come to an end and the days of everyday wear have begun. Clearly emboldened by Uniqlo's successes, Yannai may not be too far off. Casual clothing is becoming more popular, and leisure wear has been on the rise. Further, leisure wear's cousin, Athleisure, has been one of the most unmovable trends in decades, despite calls for it to be an afterthought, which seems highly unlikely. But for Uniqlo, especially in Japan, it's really no contest. Uniqlo outpaces companies like H&M and Zara almost tenfold. And in China, Uniqlo is the number one fashion retailer. Add to that, China is expected to surpass the US as the number one apparel market by 2023. And Uniqlo is also leading the way in sustainability, this era's hot button issue, but only because Uniqlo simply has less SKUs, i.e. they focus on everyday essentials propped up by collabs rather than trends leading to less stock and less production. This restraint lends a greater stability in the buying cycle with about one third of Uniqlo's items available between six and nine months, whereas 66% of Zara's products are under three months old. And with its focus on quality over quantity and longevity instead of fast fashion's quick expiration dates, Uniqlo makes good on its sustainability promise. And as Uniqlo's quality control continues to rise, parent company Fast Retailing has positioned its sister company, GU, as the fast fashion cheaper brand, which amazingly has managed to lock down affordable collections featuring the design talents of Jun Takahashi of Undercover Fan. This, among other things, giving more credence to fast retailing CEO Tadashi Anai's position, as he states, we don't chase trends. People mistakenly say that Uniqlo is a fast fashion brand. We're not. We're about clothing that's made for everyone. Along with many other factors, this has placed Uniqlo within another realm of fashion that its competitors simply aren't in. Many are calling it high street. Some even diet fast fashion, but either way, it's still due praise for a brand that started off as a simple basics retailer. However, traditional fast fashion retailers in the vein of Zara and H&M still bring in wads of cash. Zara parent company Inditex brought in about $34 billion in 2019. H&M in the same year brought in $24.3 billion. However, fast retailing Uniqlo's parent company brought in $22 billion with 83% of revenues coming from Uniqlo. Despite having less than half the stores of H&M, which operates at around 5,000 plus, and running about the same as Zara, who has 2,249. And because Uniqlo operates out of Asia predominantly, investors see this as a boon, as Uniqlo is quickly becoming, if it isn't already, the biggest apparel retailer in all of Asia. And with Asia recovering faster than the West in terms of the pandemic, and with Uniqlo's ambitious moves like working with designers like Jill Sonder, Verdi, and teaming up with Google to develop a site that uses a form of artificial intelligence, Uniqlo is looking like the correct bet. And as time progresses, the company is becoming not only the most valuable, but the most viable fashion retailer on the planet. Uniqlo's commitment to quality over quantity, its fluidity in the market, and its strategic use of collabs has officially captured the marketplace both at the consumer and investor level. The only question is, how far can it go? Well, think of it this way. The company has gotten this far without even making a huge dent in the American market, which is scary when you think about its successes thus far. The sky is the limit. If there was a better phrase, let me know. 
But for real, the question is, what do you think about Uniqlo taking the most valuable spot? Good, bad, ugly, or you don't care? Let it all hang out in the comments. And don't forget to check us out on Patreon for extra content, our private Discord, and our brand building series class. But most importantly, keep it locked right here for all of your info on international street fashion culture and business from Tokyo. It's your boy, and keep it casual. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. And I'll see you guys in a minute.